everyone and welcome back to the final triumphant video that is the ending of my historically accurate Victorian Gonzo cosplay from A Muppet's Christmas Carol. And oh, this project has absolutely pushed me to my limit and possibly beyond. I barely managed to get through it, to be honest. Nearly wanted to give up at the end. It has just been so much work, but I am so happy with the result and I am so glad with how much I learned and was able to take away from it. And just the feeling of being done is the best at this point. <laughs> I know that I have done a lot of videos on the process, that most of the pieces that I made did get their own devoted video, and a lot of research that obviously went into those different pieces, but I haven't really talked about the project itself in the larger sense, about how it came up, how I went about it, all of those things. So for me, this starts back in October. About midway through October, I watched the Muppets Haunted Mansion movie, started thinking about the Muppets Christmas Carol and Gonzo, took a look at his outfit, went, that would make a really fun cosplay. That'd be really great to do for the holiday season by the end of the year. Seemed like a great idea. I was in the middle of a really big project at the time, so I wasn't able to devote effort to it just then until the very, very end of October. And interestingly enough, I had decided to do this cosplay instead of a different historically accurate cosplay that I already had some of the supplies for, but was for an era that I didn't know a lot about. And I just felt really daunted by it. I am going to do it later, but I felt really overwhelmed just thinking about it. And I thought, haha, <laughs> that the Gonzo cosplay would be easier. Hindsight on that proved me otherwise. <laughs> But I started the project in earnest at the very end of October. As I was coming back from a big work trip, I started doing basic research and dove into the project pretty much immediately, trying to source materials, figure out sources for research and information. Quickly realized this was going to be a very, very large project. First and foremost, ideally at that point I had eight weeks. It ended up being 10 weeks of work, but at that point I was hoping for eight. And when I looked at Gonzo's outfit in detail, I began to realize just how many parts there were. We have the shirt, the waistcoat, trousers, the tailcoat, overcoat, the hat, the shoes, and all of the accessories, such as the braces, the cravat, and gloves, because why not at this point? So I really had eight major things when you clump all of those accessories together, and I had eight weeks to do all of them, to do all of the research, to do all of the sewing, to film the videos, edit the videos, get all of that out. I don't know why I thought I could do that. I think I figured some of those pieces would take less than a week, and that some of those would take a little more and then it would even out okay. Things like the tail coat ended up taking closer to two weeks and almost none of the pieces that I had to do took me less than a week. And that's how it ended up being 10 weeks rather than eight, which is still a really, frankly, impressive quantity of time to sew all of that and do all of the research. So I'm still very, very pleased with what I managed. But I thought this would be a really great opportunity to talk through some of the research process because something that large, something with so many pieces, is a daunting project under that time scale or frankly any time scale. It doesn't matter how long you want to spend on it. That is a lot of research. That is a lot of problem solving, product sourcing, and searching for information. It is just so much to take on. So for me, it starts with a cursory glance. It starts frankly, with the Pinterest board, because that gives me an idea of what I'm looking at. I was trying to zero in on 1842, but I was looking at the entirety of the 1840s, a little bit of 1830s, a little bit of 1850s. I already know that 1842 as a year is not going to get me a ton of results. And that 1840 to 45 will get me a lot more, and 1835 to 50 will get me even more. But I need to know what's different between 1835 and 1842, what isn't? What can I pull from earlier and later and what changes? So that's where that first video came in, talking about the changes in fashion history for men around that time, that they were moving from bright, colorful, flashy things into more monochromatic and simple garments, less 
fitted things. And that transition was what I was finding in my research. So that video allowed me to take that basic research and start digging a little bit deeper. When I was looking at the pins I was finding, though a lot of them don't have citations with them and therefore aren't usable on an academic level, some of them do. And you start to see things repeated over and over again. I found that original garments were mostly at the Met, v &A, and at Augusta auctions. I wouldn't have thought to check Augusta auctions, but it just kept coming up in the pins. I'm so glad that I started there. Otherwise I would have just been going through museums, never finding any images of the interior of garments. And that would have been a very uh, difficult process without those. <laughs> I was also finding that fashion plates were regularly coming up from the Met. They have a digital collection specific to fashion plates. And I was also finding a lot of other random images, whether it's photographs, advertisements, occasionally fashion plates that come from the New York Public Library. So those were some of my major individual sources. On a grander scale, I was looking, of course, Google Books and archive.org, trying to find tailoring manuals, hat making manuals, shoe making manuals, advertisements, newspapers, anything I could find. And for the more detailed text, I went into ProQuest and 19th century British newspapers, which unfortunately are not publicly accessible. They are accessible through libraries and academic institutions usually. So that took me really detailed into old newspapers and advertisements and classifieds and all sorts of detailed articles. That's where I usually start with the biggest, broadest terms like men's fashions, men's garments, and start narrowing it down by garment type, looking for terminology that I didn't know to use that might be more specific rather than general like trousers. That's gonna bring up a lot of different stuff and narrowed in on as many different topics as I could. The reason why I put research with every single one of my videos to some extent is just the fact that I had to do that research already. And I was finding these interesting stories that were cropping up when I was just simply trying to figure out what trousers look like. I wasn't trying to necessarily find drama and intrigue in all of this research. It just kept coming up. <laughs> And that's the really exciting part about history is that you find usually far, far more than you are looking for. But that's how my basic research process goes. When it comes to product sourcing, this was an absolute doozy of a project to do that on because I'm trying to navigate both the original movie garments and historically accurate options and mesh them together. So that frankly took a lot of my time. Between the research portion and the product sourcing, it was more than half of the time I spent on this project. The sewing portion was definitely less than half. There's a lot to do. The products came from all over the place, all over the world. I ordered the trouser fabric from Sweden. I ordered originally some silk fabric for the waistcoat from India. That never showed up. I had to order more from a different source. I've listed all of the sources below for all of the different bits and parts that I could remember <laughs> or that are still available because there's a lot of pieces. Some things I already had, but not very much. I had to go out and purchase almost everything. And I fortunately didn't have a really strict budget cap on this. I had the ability to find things that were going to work and purchase them without having to worry about that. Not that I'm going out there and getting things custom woven and silk for me, that is a whole different level. But I was able to find what I needed and go ahead and order it. But even with that out of the way, there is a lot of pieces and parts that you forget. Just simply how many buttons you need for each garment, what type of lining and interlining fabrics, and just all the tiny little parts and pieces that would have been easily available to the people making these garments at the time, but are not to me. So there was so much time spent just figuring out what I needed and ordering that. And that honestly was the vast majority of my first two weeks, just simply doing the research, finding the resources to start looking into these garments, amassing as much as I could, and finding all of the supplies that I needed and ordering them. Then I was able to actually start sewing. So I'd already lost two weeks at the beginning there. <laughs> 
<laughs> just to simply trying to get everything together. And what I did to keep myself going through such a big project was that I worked off set. So I knew that the shirt wasn't going to take a ton of extra time and research outside of the basic patterning of it, the construction, I was sticking to something I already knew. So while I was sewing the shirt, I took the time in usually the evenings when I didn't want to be sewing anymore when the light was gone because it is the middle of winter here and I can only film during daylight hours. So there's a lot of time that I cannot be filming or sewing because everything needs to be filmed. And so I lost a lot of time to that, but I used that for research and editing instead. And the research would be for the next garment. So I would know by the time I got to the point of patterning and cutting, every single part that I was going to need. I'd have all of my fabrics pulled, everything ordered and delivered, ready to go, the drafting manual set up with different options, lots of images of original garments ready to go. So that way, if I had a question, I had resources available. I didn't always know what questions I was going to ask the whole way through. There were tons of times things came up all of a sudden. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. How would that have been done? But I had the resources there. And this kept me excited because it kept renewing the feeling of a new project. If I treated the project as lots of different parts where I was sewing on one, but preparing for the next, getting to do the research and ordering fabrics and just the excitement that can come with the beginning of a project before you get into the really mind numbing and difficult work portion, that kept overlapping. So I'd be sewing on one thing and researching and having fun with the other. And that's what got me through up until nearly the end. And I realized at about the last two weeks, I was really over the whole thing. I was ready to be done. And I think that's because I was no longer doing the research. I was no longer ordering fabrics. I was no longer looking up and discovering new images. The novelty had worn off, the excitement was gone, and I was left with a lot of hand sewing to finish. This is also when I decided to start streaming live more often. I have now started a Twitch channel for that reason. Uh, link down below for that. I'm gonna start doing that a lot more because I'm pretty sure that's what got me through the last couple weeks of this massive project was being able to just sit and chat while I stitched away on the more mundane parts. So that is definitely something I am going to continue doing a lot in the future. So if you have any interest in that, I do find live streaming there a lot easier than some of the other places I've done it. I'm gonna try and do that regularly, whether it's sewing or other things. But that's what got me through the ending. And I know figuring out what works for you and what keeps you moving through a project and keeps you excited, it's different for every person. But for me, I know my excitement comes from the planning stages and comes from sharing it with people. So that is the point that I have finally reached. I have no more planning stages. I have no more sewing. I am ready to share this project with you. And I am so very, very grateful and excited to do that at this point. It has been so much work, but so much reward. I have learned more than I will ever realize out of this project. The knowledge that I have gained will keep coming up in future projects. And on top of that, I honestly, after having accomplished something this big in so little of time, realizing how little I knew and how much research I had to do and how much resource management I had to do, I feel like I can do anything. I feel like I can take on any project at this point, which is a great way to start the year. That's really the next place I'm going is all of my plans, that actually is my next video, is all the things I wanna do this year, all the plans that I have, all the things I want to accomplish and learn. I am so ready to move on to those because I am so excited by the fact that I did this. I managed this massive project and it really came out absolutely amazing at the end. I am overjoyed with this and I also know that I got a lot of questions about whether or not I was going to be able to drag Abby into this as Rizzo. I do recommend watching all the way to the ending of the dressing video and the little tiny bit of reveal that I've got. We do have some unbridled chaos at the end for you who kept asking about that. So I did get to have a little bit of extra fun at the end of this project as well, which is a great and perfect way to end a project that frankly felt like chaos for 10 weeks straight. 
So I invite you to enjoy watching the final results of all of my work for the last few weeks. Well, frankly, I'm going to go take a nap.
Come on! I hate this! You wanted to know what was happening in Scrooge's house. His bedroom is on this side of the house. <sighs> Jump. There are two things I hate in this life. Heights and jumping from them. <sighs> Too late now. Come on, I'll catch you. <sighs> God save my little broken body! <laughs> Walk, walk, throw. 